Let's talk about artificial intelligence. We gave birth to AI. AI. When you think of AI, you might think of this kind of thing. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. But AI is no longer science fiction. It's everywhere. From the algorithms that suggest what videos or music you might like, to predictive text, to the chatbot answering your banking inquiry. AI is becoming almost like electricity. You know, it's just something that's going to become ubiquitous. We don't recognize the extent to which our lives are being altered by the technology that is being permitted. So what exactly is AI? Why are many countries trying to figure out a way to control it? And could it already be too late? Artificial intelligence essentially means building computer systems that can solve problems and think in the way that humans do. But beyond that big idea, in practice, AI can mean a lot of different things. Intelligence, very broadly defined, is the ability to achieve complex goals. Um, and artificial intelligence is just that, but then not by humans, but by machines such as computers. AI is a huge field. And within it, there are many different approaches that try to replicate human-style decision-making. But probably the main one is what's called machine learning. It's the idea that a computer algorithm can learn from data, recognize patterns, and make decisions with little or no human interference. If you think about traditional computer programs, you're essentially giving the computer an instruction manual for how to carry out a particular task. But with machine learning, the algorithm effectively creates the instruction manual itself, and it can continuously adjust those instructions to get better at what it's designed to do. Take Google Maps, for example. It uses machine learning to combine real-time data about traffic conditions with historical data to generate super accurate predictions for how long your trip might take. And the more it does this, the better it gets at it. Now, AI technology has been around for decades. But in the last 10 years, it's really taken off for a couple of reasons. Computers are kind of doubling in power every two years, and this has been going on for decades now. And so we got to the point when we had really fast computers. We also had lots and lots of data, more data than ever before. And really, the last decade or so has been probably the most consequential period in, in artificial intelligence. Today, we're at the point where AI is being applied in almost every sector. Even on this show, we use AI software to transcribe our interviews. Also think home appliances, self-driving cars, and healthcare. It's where also I think it has most promising applications, for example, in scanning or helping radiologists identify tumors and other cancers uh, more accurately than humans can. Now, in all of the examples we've mentioned so far, the AI system is essentially just doing one thing. And there's a label for that, artificial narrow intelligence. It's really the first stage of AI, and it's where we're at right now. Then there's a big leap to the next technological frontier. That's artificial general intelligence. AGI would be where the artificial intelligence rivals human intelligence in that it's capable of doing lots of different things all at once, the way humans can. And in May, a company called DeepMind, which is owned by Google, said it had taken a step in that direction. Its AI model called Gato was able to carry out more than 600 tasks like play video games, search for images, and use a robotic arm to stack blocks all at the same time. One scientist at the company said Gato means it's game over, that achieving AGI is now just a matter of scaling up this technology. One group of people thinks if we just keep taking this approach, and make these existing systems faster and bigger, you know, scale them up in essence, eventually we'll get to something that looks like human intelligence. Um, I, I don't really think that's the case. I think we need more breakthroughs, more conceptual breakthroughs before uh, we really can build systems that can think in the way that a human being can think. 
And I suspect that that's probably decades in the future. Now, the idea that we might one day have machines that can think like humans raises a whole bunch of ethical and philosophical questions about what it could mean for society. Ava, go back to your room. Never mind the fears about the next level after that, artificial super intelligence, where the machines go beyond human intelligence and we start moving closer towards those sci-fi extremes. Skynet has become self-aware. In one hour, it will initiate a massive nuclear attack on its enemy. But we don't need to go that far to think about why we might want to control AI. Because the technology we're using today is already throwing up all sorts of issues, starting with privacy and civil liberties. So for example, facial recognition now creates a super powerful tool to identify people just through security cameras in the street. So how governments or police might use or abuse that tech is an important debate. In Russia, for example, police appear to be using it to identify anti-government protesters. And the Chinese government is probably taking it further than anyone else, using facial recognition cameras on a mass scale to track people and monitor their behavior. There are several reports that it's also using the technology for racial profiling to identify Uyghur Muslims and Tibetans. There are also big questions about bias and discrimination. So again, you've got this really powerful AI technology which can amplify biases that already exist in society. If, let's say, the AI has been trained on data that includes historical inequalities. And there are plenty of ways that can play out. In the US, for instance, a widely used algorithm to help assess healthcare needs was shown to have a built-in racial bias. Then there's the danger of design faults or problematic assumptions about the way that an AI system is intended to work. For example, the AI system was found to be a factor in the two plane crashes of the Boeing 737 MAX, one in Indonesia and one in Ethiopia. 346 people died. The autopilot was AI powered and it wasn't designed to allow for a human override. Uh, so it gave dangerous nose down commands and it forced the plane to crash. And what happens if a self-driving car kills someone? Who's responsible? There's a case going through the courts in California right now that's dealing with that very issue. The thing is, these problems aren't necessarily with the AI itself. It's about how it's applied, how much we rely on it, and whether we're even able to think through all the possible consequences. Right now, we're really worried about things like um, uh, mistakes, algorithmic mistakes. It's not a mistake by the computer. It's a mistake about how it was written, how the code was written, and whether or not the processes were put in place for adequate recourse so that you can tell if something's gone wrong. The stakes get even higher when we're talking about war and AI being used in lethal weapons. We already have armed drones controlled by people that use AI technology. But it's not a big stretch to get to fully autonomous weapons. So machines making life and death decisions about who or what to target. It's probably inevitable, but it's, it's really quite scary. You can imagine some really bad situations happening. Imagine in the Taiwan Strait, for example, having a large group of American drones facing off Chinese drones, and they're trained on classified data, how these two swarms of drones interact and whether they might accidentally uh, fire at one another because they mistake maybe some light reflecting of a drone for an attack. Um, that could mean that you accidentally end up in a war or even a nuclear conflict. Proposals for an international ban on autonomous weapons have languished at the UN since 2017. There's been plenty of talking, but no agreement. The US says it wants a non-binding code of conduct instead of an outright ban. But it's not just the AI used in weapons that people want to control. Almost every major jurisdiction is thinking about regulating AI in some shape or form. China's been moving fast. In March, it put a pretty ambitious law in place to regulate AI. It's focused on the private sector, especially tech companies, forcing them to be transparent about how AI is being used. The EU is working on its own set of rules. Its proposals categorize AI technology according to risk. So there is a list of banned practices, like real-time facial recognition by police. There are high-risk uses, like AI being used to hire people or to manage essential services like electricity and water. 
That kind of tech would need to follow strict rules on transparency, especially around the software development and testing. Then there's the limited risk, stuff like spam filters and customer service bots, which would need to be clearly labeled so that you would always know if you're talking to a person or a machine. The EU law is still at least three years away because there's still a long bureaucratic process to go through. But experts say it could set a precedent for other countries. I think there are going to be a lot of different rules and, and different governance styles, and they need to be somewhat compatible, but we also need to respect that different societies have the right to determine exactly how they want to trade off um, security and privacy and, and those kinds of things. So is AI out of control? Well, in some ways, yes. The technology is moving so fast and any meaningful regulation is still years away. But in the end, AI is not that different from other kinds of technology. It's got enormous power for good and enormous power for bad. So it's up to us and our governments to figure out how we want to use it. Another place AI is used is in making deep fake videos. Check out our episode all about that.